it is with a sheer pleasure that I welcome Alan D'Souza to Cranon Art Museum. Alan is coming to us from the University of California, Berkeley, where he is associate professor and chair of the Department of Art Practice. An artist of exceptional range, Alan's practice includes photoconceptual and text-based text works, performance, sculptures, installation, criticism, and fiction. Indeed, as is amply evident in Through the Black Country, the expedition currently on view up at CAM, Alan flourishes in the fusion of media, using mimicry, layering, reversal, and artifice to unsettle our assumptions and to call attention not only to our acts of looking, but also to their very precarity. Alan's sleight of hand is everywhere in his work. His images possess a, temp a temporal quality, where elements of illusion and surprise yield to a dawning recognition, recognition of something familiar, a southwestern landscape, a view from an airplane window, a popular painting by Paul Gauguin. This elusive and allusive quality is a deliberate strategy of the artist sub to subvert the documentary claims of photography and to probe our own attachments to the idea of authentic places, histories, and unequivocal truths. Connected to the South Asian di diaspora in East Africa, Alan was born in Nairobi and moved with his family to London during the heady yet uncertain days of Kenyan independence. While this biography informed his critical ruminations on being placed and racialized, gendered, in temporal frames, as well as his participation as an activist in the black British art movement in the 1980s, his practice moves well beyond identitarian politics to engage instead with the ongoing fallout of colonialism and empire, from the diaries of Henry Morton Stanley to the Brexit vote of 2016. Alan has held numerous artist, um, artist residencies and fellowships across the globe, and his work has been shown extensively in the US and internationally. His forthcoming book, How Art Can Be Thought, is an examination of art pedagogy and a lexicon of terms commonly used to discuss art. Other writings have been published in various journals, anthologies, and catalogs, including Third Text, London Art Practical, and Shifter Journal New York. Having had the privilege of working with Alan on several projects, including an exhibition here in 2010 featuring selections from his divine redactions, terrain, and lost pictures work, I've come to know Alan as a most provocative thinker, a generous collaborator, and an irreverent co-conspirator in this world of making exhibitions. So please join me in welcoming Alan D'Souza. Uh, thank you so much, Alison. Although I have to say, it's, it is kind of weird to, to be just standing there when someone so close to you is talking, talking about you. <laughs> um, OK, I'm going to. Um, the, the video I had playing um, was actually um, part of a larger work um, as part of an installation. And I'll, I'll show you some of the stills from that uh, later on. Um, OK. So this is uh, just the, um, the kind of title page of the show upstairs. Um, and for those of you who've seen it already, then it will be familiar. Um, and I'm not actually going to show um, or, or talk about that project. Um, but uh, we'll talk about work that sort of leads up to it. And I uh, just want to sort of place my work um, with, I guess, I guess, things that I've been thinking about just in the last week um, or so. And, uh, hopefully that will become apparent why it's been in the last week. Um, so an artwork exists or occurs physically in the world, but it also functions as a complex of fictional propositions in ways that we can compare to a novel or to a movie as more or less convincing what-if events uh, to be experienced or to, be, or to investigate. And I'm particularly interested in the scenarios in which we are invited to imagine how one body stands in for others, the most common being the fictional protagonist uh, of, a, of a novel or a movie standing for, in for or being the, the point of identification for the viewer. Um, and why I've been thinking about this very recently is that I belatedly, belatedly saw the week, uh, saw the, uh, the film The Shape of Water, I just saw it last week. Um, the main Italianish uh, character, Eliza Esposito, is played by a very non-Italian actress, by a British actress. Her name, um, the character's name, 
Espos Esposito was historically given to foundlings who were given up for adoption, so we are already clued in to a lost and mute body, a body that cannot speak itself, nor of its origins. In relation to exactly such a non-speaking body, the philosopher Jacques Ancier, who also last week I attended a lecture of his, um, he considers politics or the political moment as that in which the non-speaker claims speech or proves that they can speak. And this is similar to Gayatri Spivak's question of whether the, the subaltern can speak and to what degree that speech is muted or mutated through the systems that might appear to enable speech. Uh, and in this case, uh, the, the university uh, or the museum. The Shape of Water is not considered a political film in the same way as, say, the, the film Black Panther, which I also saw last week, um, has in overwhelming ways acquired the burden of speaking for um, an African-American future imaginary, as well as an African imaginary. But I'm not, I'm not going to get into that, since that's a much longer discussion. In The Shape of Water, Eliza and her closeted friend, Giles, with no last name, um, and her co-worker, Zelda, they represent disability, queerness, and blackness, respectively, all of which come together in, in the body of the unnamed creature, played by Doug Jones, who previously acted as the amphibian Abe Sapien in, in the film Hellboy, also directed by Guillermo del Toro. So I'm being kind of a little bit um, insiderish, revealing my sort of uh, interest in sci-fi uh, movies. Um, who's, who's actually seen um, The Shape of Water? Okay, well, oh, actually not that many of you. Okay. Uh, in the film, disability, femininity, queerness, and blackness extend to other relations and locations in the film and are more complexly represented than I'm doing justice here. For, Eli for example, Eliza's white femininity is clearly sexual and, and depicted as such right at the beginning of the film, um, but it's, it's depicted as sexually isolated and closely aligned with Giles's also isolated sexuality. These bodily fluidi fluidities and containments are spelled out by the film title of The Shape of Water. The film is set in Baltimore, which isn't where, as one character suggests, where anyone would choose to be. Um, and it is set during the, the pre-civil rights segregation um, and at the height of the Cold War with its fears of alien and foreign infiltration, uh, which is the era of the, era of the body snatchers. The film also falls within a genealogy of water monsters, quote unquote, um, post Creature from the Black Lagoon from 1954, and which inspired Guillermo del Toro enough to sign on to do a remake, uh, which the studio later canceled. Um, and the film is pre-Swamp Thing, uh, the comic series that made its debut in the 1970s. The movie depicts the intersection of the two main characters' bodies, uh, in a love that dare not speak its name, to quote the poem, Two Loves, by Alfred Douglas. His poem, poem depicts a dream of a perfect love, one that crosses all societal prescriptions and restrictions. And in this case of the movie, it speaks also to love that crosses the societal prescriptions around race, gayness, and disability. Yet, as I said, this is considered less as a political film and more as a fairy tale. So in talking about those movies, I'm, I'm sort of setting a kind of um, a, a loose ground, as it were. And I, I've sort of wandered off the path of my own work. But these are the kinds of questions um, about which kinds of bodies are represented and who gets to speak and what points of identification the viewer has uh, and which kinds of viewer are prioritized uh, through those points of entry, and who actually assumes the, the, the role of, of speaker. So moving towards my own work, um, and as, as I said, I'm not going to talk about the gallery that's in the, uh, the installation in the gallery upstairs, um, but I, I want to offer some entry points. Um, the protagonist in the installation upstairs is a Muslim Indo-African um, named Hafid Sidi Mubarak Mumbai. 
I know I said I wasn't going to talk about it, but just, just a little bit. Um, his expedition is, is a fairy tale. And like all fairy tales, there is an element of the fable. In its proposition of, an, of a speaker, uh, a fictional one, an expedition leader, a discoverer, and this is Hafid, it is a claim to counter speech against who and what Edouard Glissant, Edouard Glissant has described as, and I quote, Western discoverers, explorers, merchants, conquerors, ethnologists, those men of intelligence, faith, and law. Hafid is one of many counter-speakers who, in this very politicized moment in which the non-speaker, the one who, who had been erased from history, the one who is rendered mute in the present, claims speech and proves that they can speak and claims territory from which to speak. One of my artistic methods is to chart what Rosie Braidotti describes as figurations or cartographies of the present. And at the risk of overstating my case, I'm presenting her description here, as cartography is a politically informed map of one's historical and social locations, enabling the analysis of situated formations of power and hence the elaboration of adequate forms of resistance. And so that's really one way that I think about my work um, as a kind of network of social relations uh, which are materialized um, through the art object. Um, but it really becomes enacted through the viewer. And so while my work is conventionally not interactive art, um, I do rely on it um, uh, to be activated. And, and so, um, I mean, I, I do consider it as a kind of social practice, um, even though it takes the form of you know, framed works um, on the wall, text, and so on. But um, underlying it is, 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 a, is a, I guess, layers of performance. So I'm going to go back to sort of earlier work that really lays some of this, um, and, uh, and, and also to complicate this notion of what comes early, what comes later, um, and, and in fact, even uh, the, the notion of a timeline. So the, um, the series here, uh, Rumpty Pumpty, um, uh, Rumpty Tumpty, uh, and this is number five, and you see the dates are from 1997 to 2007. So uh, they photographed in 1997 um, and then printed uh, last year and exhibited last year. Um, and I'm not sure how well you can see. Um, you, uh, can, you know, usually photographers will clean their negatives, and these are shot in film, will clean the negatives before printing. And so in that 20 year period, um, before printing them for an exhibition last year, I decided not, not to clean my negatives. So in the print itself, um, you get the 20 years of dust, um, and you can see, I don't know, there's a sort of little sort of marks everywhere on the print. Um, and in some ways, the, um, there's an, an image uh, which shows you a moment from 1997, but the surface of the print actually um, conveys to you the, the 20 years of the passage of time. Um, and there was something also that I, I didn't want these to be pristine images uh, because, of the, because of the content. Um, some of you might recognize this, this location. And, uh, and I'll, I'll show three images from that series. So there's um, uh, a Muslim family um, uh, in the same site. Uh, and here's a larger view of that location. It's the Trump Taj Mahal Casino in um, New Jersey, um, which I think has now been demolished. Uh, last year, they had a, a fire sale to sell off all the interior fittings. Um, and so um, they, they were f in an exhibition of contemporary South Asian work. Um, and my work doesn't really fit that easily within um, that terminology of South Asian art. It doesn't look South Asian, whatever we imagine South Asianists to look like. 
um, and and I deliberately participate in, in those kinds of exhibitions in order to expand expand and extend um, how we might think of those kinds of designations. And so I put in um, these three images, um, and which were then subsequent. This was the image that was used uh, for the publicity and, and on the cover brochure and so on. And so most people, I think, assumed it was an image in South Asia. Um, and a kind of orientalist, exotic, uh, an image almost of a past moment of how we might um, wish India could be. Um, and the fact that it's actually the, the Trump casino, and, against as a, and again as a kind of orientalized uh, vision of a past India. Um, and it's not just Trump that's doing it. It's also um, uh, a Hindu fundamentalism uh, in India itself who are claiming this kind of um, mythical heritage and, and also aligning uh, with Trump in the present um, in, in, in terms of trade relations. Um, so again, it's an image which doesn't appear to be political, but it becomes politicized by being activated um, by other events that are happening outside that image. And, and that's really one way I, th I think of my work um, being activated by, by circumstances and how viewers come to them. Um, so I'm going to go through um, fairly quickly some, some of these pieces. Uh, these, these are from the Terrain series. Um, and um, I, th I think of sort of fairly innocuous, uh, barren landscapes, the idea of uh, terra nullius, of empty land, which um, certainly was part of the rhetoric of, of um, um, Manifest Destiny. Um, it's also the rhetoric of apartheid South Africa and so on, um, as empty land that's await, waiting to be inhabited um, by, by the sort of influx of new migrants. Um, there's another image. Uh, and each image has its own title as part of the terrain series. Um, so these two, for example, the, the previous one and this one, um, they're, they're made from models, which are, which are very small and, and deliberately abject. Um, so the, the surface of, of this is paper, um, and it's essentially a painting. It's, it's stained by um, me looking at my own body. Um, and uh, the objects you can see there, are um, those are eyelashes in, in the foreground, which gives you a sense of scale of the object itself. And um, um, what could be tumbleweed or, I know, herds of bison, um, are actually uh, little balls of earwax. Um, so, um, you know, it's, it's very deliberately made from the sort of cast-offs of my own body. And so, um, I guess creating this image of empty land. And I was think, thinking particularly of the American Southwest and the sort of the, the idea of the frontier um, and the sort of desert that, you know, that I was familiar with growing up and sort of watching Western movies, as I'm sure so many of you are. And so there's that image of the sort of frontier um, was really part of my upbringing. Uh, and so it didn't matter where you were in the world. Um, you, you were kind of um, immersed in American popular culture. Uh, and it has its uh, effect. And so you know, these are part of the, the sources for my own work. Uh, there are others in the series um, which are different kinds of landscapes, uh, but, but also connected to the body. And, and using materials that one ingests or somehow associated with sort of um, uh, digestive systems. Um, so um, uh, this is actually cake icing, uh, dental floss, and chocolate. Um, this one is salt and uh, fingernails and toenail clippings. Uh, the fingernails and toenails will come up again in another work. Um, uh, and then a slightly different series um, are, are making uh, other landscapes that were more familiar from news images. And uh, 2001, this is after the initial bombing of Afghanistan, um, and hence the title. 
Um, and these were kind of these are the kinds of landscapes we were seeing in the news of these or, already derelict um, spaces, which are then being further bombed. Um, and this is uh, again another model that's made out of men melted candles. And so the little black objects you see are the, are the candle wicks. Um, and this is also um, this was made around November, December. Um, and I think also in my mind was um, all the shrines in New York uh, after 9-11. Uh, and so afterwards, one would wander the streets of New York and see the remnants, remnants of all these melt, melted candles everywhere. Okay, at the same time, um, the, the title is actually a quote from um, a GI uh, in, in Iraq. Um, basically, anything that moves west of a certain um, ter line in the territory, anything that moves, you could shoot, shoot to kill. Um, so th this was uh, something that was mentioned, um, and I guess the terminology at the time was the kill box. Um, and again, it's it's a model. Um, uh, these are recycled trash um, bottles, um, cardboard boxes. Uh, egg cartons, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it's on a surface of carpet. So basically, I just built the installation, photographed it. Um, I was doing a residency in Manhattan, actually, in 2001. Um, and so these are materials uh, collected off the streets of Manhattan, lower Manhattan, um, transistor parts, old bits of computer, and so on. Um, and this was made, uh, my residency was in May, uh, April, to, April to June. So yeah, April, May, June. Um, and so these were, these were works done before 9-11. Um, and this was the image for the, the invite card that I was supposed to, for a solo show that I was supposed to have in September. Um, and there was no way to use this image after 9-11. And so the show was then uh, postponed. Um, uh, Madinat al Salam, um, Arabic for the city of peace. Um, and um, it's also a name given to a kind of mythical version of Baghdad from the seventh century. And we don't have any archaeological evidence of it, uh, it just really, we know about it through literature. Uh, and again, made from recycled materials. Um, so, th you know, I was showing those photographs of models um, uh, which, which I made and then photographed alongside some of these um, photographs of Vegas. And people also assumed that I'd made these as models. Um, and, you know, Vegas just seems so artificial. Um, uh, you know, and, and the titles, um, which kind of seems so dated now, but Caesar lays foundations for a new day. Uh, it's Caesar's Palace, and it's the uh, foundation uh, for um, Celine Dion's, um, the theater that was built for her show, and uh, her show was called A New Day. So actually, I mean, it's, it's a very literal description of the site. Um, but it also has, uh, this is 2002. Um, I'm photographing on the first anniversary of 9-11, and it's during the initial occupation of Iraq. Um, the only rainbow I've seen in Vegas, um, and the sign, obviously, God bless America, because of the anniversary of 9-11. Um, and this is, um, actually, there's a better image coming up, uh, but this is the, um, Aladdin Casino, and uh, the Aladdin Casino is on the far left. Um, and soon after, actually, it was demolished because um, Aladdin is the thief of Baghdad, and so the casino itself was a version of Baghdad. Um, it, it's no longer there. Um, so this is this is Vegas, and this is why it looks like a model. Um, uh, the thief of Baghdad, Aladdin, on the left. Uh, in the middle is the Goncourt brothers, um, uh, which is representing Paris. Um, 
the white building there with the American flag is Caesar's Palace. Okay, um, so the Goncourt brothers stand between Caesar and the thief of Baghdad. Um, and again, it's a very uh, descriptive title, um, which was particular to the time. It was um, just after the vote in the UN uh, uh, about whether UN granting permission to the US to in invade Iraq. And France is one of the few countries that vetoed it. Um, so in some ways, uh, um, I mean, it's a documentary photograph of a location, but it takes on a kind of political narrative um, because of circumstances. Okay. Um, so a lot of my work does, ex uh, does depend on um, existing locations and, and Vegas as, as something that is a kind of um, a simulation of other locations. Uh, you know, so, so Paris, Baghdad, um, you know, ancient Rome, and so on. Um, so there's, I, I'm always interested in, in, in the pre-existing um, and the effect it has on our imaginations uh, and then in, within our physical surroundings. So I was doing a residency in Maine, and um, uh, in midwinter, so this was January, uh, in Maine, um, and looking out of my studio window, um, there was something very familiar about it. And eventually I realized it reminded me of this painting by Peter Bruegel. Uh, and this is the view out of my studio. And so I made that piece, um, The Return of the Hunted, after Peter Bruegel. Um, and instead of his, um, his hunters returning with the pack of dogs, um, I have images of me. And I'm sort of uh, with broomsticks rather than um, spears. Um, and uh, there's a yellow ribbon on the tree. Um, and so this is also during um, election um, period. Um, the, one of the dogs on the left is sniffing uh, a torn up Al Gore poster. Um, um, and I, I guess there is an autobiographical element in, in that one of my jobs post-university um, was as a road sweeper. Um, OK. Um, so the, the video that was playing when, when you walked in of the, the plane coming into land um, and whose shadow appears actually like a drone, um, it's connected to this series, the Divine series. Um, and so. Um, it's fairly low resolution video um, because I was photographing and shooting video at a time when you're told no electronics, no cameras allowed. Uh, again, post 9 11. Um, and the, the images are completely innocuous. I'm photographing clouds, the landscape below. Um, and so, you know, I was very prepared to show, to actually hand, hand over my camera to show that there's nothing, I'm not conducting surveillance. Um, uh, you know, or which is uh, what a passenger accused me of, actually, uh, and said to me, um, "I don't care. Uh, I don't care who you are. Those are not tourist photos. And as an American sitting, citizen, I'm demanding that you stop." Which became the title of, of a subsequent show that I did of, of these works. Um, and which also gave me a way of thinking about how these works might function. Um, so the, the, um, the images of uh, looking straight out the window um, and photographing, and then the images are mirror imaged. Um, so if you, you could kind of tilt your heads um, and look at one side of the image, that, that's really what you're looking at. And then putting them together creates these um, I guess divine images of sort of gods and um, other kinds of de divine beings or monsters and so on. Uh, and I was interested in, in um, how our imagining of, of these other sort of beings or divine beings um, can really be just derived from the landscapes uh, around us. This is actually Chicago, uh, suburbs of Chicago. Uh, 
this I think of as a Ganesh image. I guess I think of this one as sort of Mayan. Um, and a kind of pre-Columbian image as well. Um, again, Chicago. I don't know what it is about Chicago and kind of death masks. Um, and then others which look like shrines. One of the things that also um, intrigued and sometimes really worried uh, passengers sitting next to me was that I would clean the windows before photographing. Um, uh, uh, and I realized um, this was during a time when I'm being profiled uh, in planes. So uh, there's something very deliberate, but also very careful about, uh, about photographing in, in those kinds of public spaces. OK. Uh, and then another series um, w with those um, landscape images uh, of the, the kind of um, the, the, the photographs of the plane the plane itself, again, photographed through the window, so the, the, the wings, the, the tail, uh, and also the tarmac, the, the airport itself. Um, and I'll show you some details. Uh, but you know, these are constructed of, um, again, a mirror imaged um, five sections. Um, and you, know, you can see better in the details. Uh, but then that create these uh, kind of missile shapes. Or, or rockets, or unidentified flying objects, or unidentified foreign objects, which, which was how I was being profiled. OK, I'm going to make a big jump. Um, just go with me. Back to, um, oh, I'll tell you what they are in a minute. Um, OK, the Scratch series, um, and they're, they're photographs of uh, hairstyles of um, blonde American actresses from different decades. OK. Uh, Mae West. Marilyn. Monroe. Jane Mansfield. This is for the ones of, uh, um, in, in the audience who are, I guess, in their upwards of 50s, uh, in their 50s and so on. Although, it, um, for those who are sort of younger, you'll start recognizing them. Uh, Farrah Fawcett uh, and Pamela Anderson. Um, and, and these are made from my fingernails and, and beard shavings. Um, so the background is uh, beard shavings and um, the hair itself, um, fingernail clippings and from a, a, a collection of about 20 years. So just some details. It, it just seems like such a waste to throw these things away. <laughs> you know, so. Okay. so I have a, a, a few sort of hair pieces, as, as it were. Um, uh, um, this is a collabor collaboration between uh, a young son men, who was my partner at the time, and also an artist, and my two children. Um, and she is not their mother. Um, but we're traveling in Europe, um, going from Paris uh, to Portugal, and we're trying to pass um, as a European family on holiday. OK, hence, <laughs> hence the title, Tress and, and Pass. And this is in Poitiers. And so then we would go up to people and I'd just ask them to take our photographs. Um, um, and you know, people were kind of very polite about this, and, and um, you, you know, took our photographs, uh, occasionally um, engaged us in conversation, um, but not mention the wigs. And it's kind of like that Monty Python skit, whatever you do, don't mention the war. This was, whatever you do, don't mention the wigs. Um, but walking around, we could hear people behind us talking about what have we done to the children. Um, 
Um, and then uh, we, this is Bill Bell, and um, we're queuing up to go into the um, Guggenheim Museum. And here it changes because people realize it's a performance. This is a museum audience. They're waiting in line to go into the museum. Um, and they're laughing. And this is when the kids, you can see, they are now embarrassed. <laughs> um, and we got as far as Madrid, and that was it. The kids were like, we're not doing this anymore. <laughs> Um, so, and we were also having our portraits drawn. And again, the portrait artist, no mention of the wigs, as if this was totally normal. Okay, another hairpiece. Um, again, Yong Sun Min and myself um, will bleep for peace. Um, and we did this twice. Um, again, first time um, during the invasion of Afghanistan. Um, and it's invoking John Lennon and Yoko Ono's bed piece. Um, and they did it as a way to bring attention to and protest the Vietnam War. Um, and so, yeah, we wrote to Yoko Ono, asked for her permission. Um, uh, but this is the 2002 version, um, 2003 version, uh, the invasion of Iraq. Um, Yoko Ono gave us her permission. Uh, she sent us the flowers, which was wonderful. Um, Yong Sun Min does a pretty good um, Yoko Ono. I'm sort of less convincing as John Lennon. Uh, and I do say this, that um, I look much more like the Maharishi. Um, um, but we, we stayed in the gallery um, for the duration of the um, opening times, and people would just come in and sit. And um, we invited them to talk about anything they wanted to talk about, basically. And we would sometimes bring in discussions around the war. Um, and we would ask them, what would you do for peace? And, um, and then they could fill in these little kind of speech bubbles of what they would do um, and, and gave it to us. Um, you know, people say, I will sing for peace, I will make drawings, I will, I will cook, you know, all, all kinds of things. Um, and then this became a, a sort of peace quilt, which we then gave to Yoko Ono. Um, and people were also cutting our hair for souvenirs, and, and sometimes they would attach the hair as well. Um, so it, it, it's a much more elaborate, the uh, other elements of the installation. Um, but I'm going through it fairly quickly. There was a projection on the opposing war, and so it's being live streamed as well. Okay, yeah, another hairpiece. Um, so this is me doing a performance in Korea, um, in South Korea. Um, and um, the migrant workers in South Korea are predominantly Chinese but there are also substantial numbers from South Asia, mostly Bang Bangladesh and Pakistan. Um, and so I'm here at the opening um, serving drinks. Um, and everyone just assumed um, the gallery had hired a migrant worker um, to staff the, uh, the opening, to serve drinks at the opening. And a few people complained to the gallery that this is really uh, not very good practice. Um, so anyway, there I am, uh, dressed all in white, barefoot, um, not speaking. Um, but I'm, I'm simply serving it. I don't speak Korean anyway. Um, serving drinks. And then at some point in the opening, um, I gather together all the sort of empty um, uh, uh, glasses or glasses with residue uh, of liquid in there and um, empty them all into a basin, a white basin on a white pedestal in the middle of the gallery. And, and using that liquid, I begin to shave what little hair I have, um, or uh, kind of stubble. And with um, that shaving water, refill the glasses and carry on serving them. Oh. <laughs> I love your humor. Um, OK. Um, so uh, I mean, essentially, that people had accepted my labor. And so then it's really just offering the body that 
I guess that's kind of biblical, isn't it? I never thought of that. I'm offering the body, <laughs> offering the body that, that produced the labor. Um, and most people were very polite. They took their glasses and, and then for the duration of the evening just walked around with these four glasses. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. The, the, there is a segue to these, actually. Um, uh, these are from the, the Lost Picture series. And, um, uh, oh, the, the date actually is, is, is incorrect. It's from um, 1962 to 2004. And, and they work in a similar way as the first three images I showed you. Um, the, um, the photographs, initial photographs were taken uh, from 1962 to 1965 by my father. Um, and he took them as, as 35 millimeter slides, um, which then in 2004, um, after my mother died, I, I made them into eight by 10 prints and, and put these images uh, around my apartment. Um, and they're, they're images of, of the family in, in Kenya. Um, and uh, during um, the transition uh, from a colony to independence. And so this image actually um, uh, is taken on Independence Day. And you can see in the background the sort of black, red, and green of the, the Kenyan flag. Uh, and it's during the, sort of, it, during the parade. Um, and all of them, in all of the image, uh, are my siblings and myself. And you can just make out in the foreground. The figure in the middle is not my father, as various people ask me. Um, it's actually a, a figure in a gorilla costume as, as a kind of representation of Africa. Okay. Um, so uh, the same day, another image um, from that series. Uh, uh, I'm on the left, uh, my brother on the right, and again, not my father, but a cardboard cutout figure of a train conductor. Um, and so again, the sort of invocation of the train as a symbol of the nation, but uh, in, in a similar way that uh, it was used in the US, uh, but the sort of opening up of the West Coast from the East. And so again, from in East Africa, from the coast into the interior, the, the train became the symbol of the sort of progress, this idea of progress. I should mention, just going back, um, that the, I put these images around my apartment. This image was in my shower, and, and over a period of months gets washed away. Um, this one was in my basin, um, and so um, it's, it's toothpaste. Uh, after brushing my teeth. Um, each. Um, so, you know, it, 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 the accumulation of detritus uh, and, you know, dust and hair, um, lint and so on, um, from the sort of domestic space and, and from, uh, you know, the body. I mean, most, of the, most of the dust in, in any kind of domestic setting is, you know, 90% from human bodies. Um, and so that creates a surface which uh, speaks to the present. And so I was interested in, in how memory itself works as, as not, not of a specific moment, um, which is what we think of as, as the moment that the memory is formed and the photograph of the past, of that past moment, but how memory changes over a period of time. And so our recollection of the past changes over, over a period of time. It's always fragmentary. It's always in the process of being lost and reconstructed. And, and so I was interested in whether a photograph can do something similar um, to represent a past moment, but to represent also the passage of time and the present moment in which the, re the recall is being performed. And so the surface essentially speaks to the present, and the image embedded is, is, is the one of the past. Uh, and, and here's the detail. So I'll just go through these. Um, you know, and, and depending on, on the duration that they were in my apartment and, and what kind of staining, it's also the image of the past gets erased 
or uh, completely overlaid by other kinds of um, stainings and sort of detritus, detritus and so on. And so, you know, which is also how memory works, uh, as a, this sort of, as I mentioned, a kind of constant loss and erasure from accumulation of new material. Um, now, I mentioned this was, this was um, the work, uh, the first body of work I did after my mother died. And I just returned from, from Kenya. Um, and, uh, and so it is about revisiting um, the idea of a, of, of a motherland. Um, but also, there's all kinds of um, relations to uh, my mother herself, who was born in Kenya as well. Um, and, and, I, and I guess a kind of mourning uh, for, for different kinds of loss. Um, um, my mother was also um, uh, blind when she died. And I'd taken all these photographs in Nairobi um, specifically to show her. Um, and I didn't know she, she had, she'd been going through chemo uh, therapy, which afflict, affected her eyesight, and which rapidly declined. So at the time I was taking the photographs, I didn't know this. So I photographed places that she'd lived, places where she'd worked, and so on. Um, and then I spent the last week with her uh, describing those photographs, uh, which she couldn't see. Um, and so for me, this, as a photographer, this also became a kind of crisis of the image, that they ha it had to be translated back into a kind of verbal language. Um, but it also became a kind of opportunity for me for other kinds of work and to tend to really investigate what the photograph does and its relationship to, to language. Um, so this series is also connected to an essay that I wrote about that whole process. Um, and the essay has been published in, in a few places. Um, and if anyone, if you go to my website, you can find it and download it. It's called My Mother, My Sight. Um, okay, so there's a detail, and, and, and that's me. Uh, and I'll come back to some of these details in another piece. Um, so as part of this series, there, there were also images of my mother. Um, and these are treated differently. I found I couldn't put them around the apartment. I couldn't sort of bear to look at them on a sort of daily basis. Um, and so, um, um, and you know, at a distance, it again appears to be a photograph. And uh, if I show you a detail, um, I've digitally scratched away at it, uh, essentially erasing the image, but turning it into um, what looks like a drawing. Um, and so there's a kind of way that actually I'm forcing myself to look at, at the photograph uh, and every inch of its surface. Um, uh, in order to, to do this kind of um, very labor-intensive uh, erasing. Um, and, I th and for me, that was part of the mourning process as well, by making myself look. Um, and another one of my mother. Mm, with a detail. OK. Um, so this was um, a series uh, or an installation I did in New Orleans after Katrina. Um, and uh, I think after, after seeing that series, actually, The Lost Pictures, someone asked me to do an ins installation uh, in New Orleans um, uh, around some of these questions of mourning and loss. Um, and so um, in the gallery space, um, I constructed a map of, of New Orleans but made up of my family photographs, and my whole collection of family photographs. Um, and uh, let me just go through a few of these. Um, and so if, uh, the, the installation is called The Courses of Empire after Thomas Cole's uh, series of paintings, The Course of Empire. Um, and so in order to get to the images at the back, you have to walk over uh, my family photographs and, and sort of erase them in the process and sort of mark them in the process. Um, and the images on the back wall, um, there, there are some um, landscape images which are constructed from sort of models similar to the ones I showed earlier, um, but mostly of um, um, oil rigs. 
and, and power stations. Um, and these are details. So people started taking selfies of um, themselves standing in their neighborhoods, actually, which was kind of interesting. Um, and, and actually, you approached from the elevators into the installation from the same direction that the sea comes in. Um, and then on the back wall were these already erased images of my siblings and myself from, from the Lost, series, uh, Lost Picture series. So people were kind of doing to the family photographs on the floor um, what had previously been done to the images on the walls. Uh, so the Redaction series, 2010. Um, I'm going through fairly quickly, but, and, but I, I'm hoping that you'll make up the associations yourself between one body of work and another, um, even though they appear to be very different. Um, so these are the Redaction series, and I've gone back to um, 19th century uh, paintings and redacted them. Uh, so let me give you an example. So here's a, a Gauguin painting, a woman with a flower. And on my left is my redacted version. Um, and so what, I, what I'm doing, um, I'm taking the color from the furthest point in the painting, in this case, the back wall, um, and then overlaying it um, onto, other, onto every other color. And so I'm digitally selecting colors um, and then overlaying the, the, the background onto it. Um, but just selecting by color tends to leave lines intact, because where two colors meet, another color is formed. And so those color, the edges remain intact. So you can still recognize the painting. Um, and so I'm actually bringing the furthest point to the closest point to the, to the viewer. Um, so the titles, um, I'm re uh, redacting in, in parentheses, I'm redacting the title. Uh, you know, so that just removing the vowels, those, so it reads woman with flower. And once people realize this, they're actually able to, to read them pretty easily. The, the title Imperial is from the um, Benjamin Moore color paint swatch that clo most closely um, resembles that color. So um, it's the colors that we use to decorate our interior domestic spaces. Okay, so um, the, the colors came ready formed, uh, the, the titles came ready formed for me. Uh, and so detail, just so you can see how the surface works a little bit. Um, uh, Rousseau. So I was using Gauguin Rousseau. Um, Gauguin, because he's always traveling, um, and the sort of fantasy of sort of other locations. And Rousseau, because he's producing these sort of jungle images, but never leaves France. And his source material is the botanical gardens, the zoo, the natural history museum, and so on. So there's the Rousseau, fight between a tiger and a buffalo, and my redaction, uh, and a detail. Gauguin, Judith, the 13-year-old girl he lived with in Paris. Redaction, there's, there's a detail of her head. Um, I think it's hard to see these, actually, in the slide. But, uh, so I'll, I'll go through them quickly. Um, secret garden, man with an ax. Oh, um, so, OK, that was a bit of a jump. Um, it's actually, uh, so X-Man series, again, from, uh, this was done from a series of performances, uh, but they're also invoking Gauguin and Rousseau. Um, okay, maybe there's no easy way to talk about the monkeys. Um, okay, but from um, the flute player from uh, Rousseau's painting. Uh, the, the text backwards at the top. Um, the darker the berry, the sweeter the juice. Um, so these images are intentionally racist. Um, 
Um, but they also were close to the images that were circulating of Barack Obama as, as an ape. Um, that suddenly started appearing everywhere. Um, I don't have it with me, um, but even in like store windows, there, there's an uh, image of a store window for Barnes & Noble, um, which had a uh, kind of um, a sort of animal section of all these uh, books about uh, monkeys and apes. Right in the middle was um, the autobiography of Obama. Um, yeah, so the backgrounds are really t are taken from Gauguin and Rousseau. And there's a detail. How are we doing for time? Another minute? <laughs> okay, um, can I do this one? Maybe I'll sort of make, might make this the last piece. Uh, if there's a way to come out of this. Um, I'm going to... See if I can find. Oh, it's gone. Oh, I'm not going to show this one. Okay. Okay. Um, hmm. Oh, that's your file. Sorry. Oh, you get to see Alison Papua's desktop. I'm trying to find. Um, so talk amongst yourself, Swona. Okay. I had opened it, but I can't find it, so I'm going to open it again. Um, and uh, so um, I, I mentioned translation right at the beginning, and I'm sort of interested in um, what happens in, in that process of translation, and obviously related to my own sort of history and background. Um, uh, and also um, going back to the sort of material culture of um, the late 19th century, um, that period of high colonialism. Um, and so I've been, you know, Gauguin, Rousseau. Um, I've also uh, rewritten Heart of Darkness, Joseph Conrad's novel. Um, and I've, I've done it in a way that um, when read aloud, it rhymes with Conrad's text. Uh, and so I'm going to show, uh, just play you a short excerpt from it. And so what you'd have to do, um, the voiceover um, is Conrad's text. Um, and the visual is my text. So you have to read my text while simultaneously listening to Conrad's text uh, and do the sort of simultaneous translation between the two. Um, my, mine is, uh, is a novel that makes sense in its own right. Um, and it takes place on a cruise ship uh, during a wedding party. And the cruise ship is um, adrift. Uh, the people in the wedding party don't know that. Um, and it's, it's also a way of trying to engage with the contemporary moment, or at least contemporary to when the work was made, um, in that the text consists of uh, the guests at the, at the wedding party um, listening into their conversations and their, their mental chatter. And so it's everything that they're anxious about, everything that's in the news, um, uh, you know, their desires, anxieties, and so on. Okay? So let me play. I think the sound should be okay. Um, The sound will come up in a minute. Heart of darkness. The Nelly, a cruising yawl, swung to her anchor without a flutter of the sails in all the rest. The flood had made, the wind was nearly calm, and being bound down the river, the only thing for it was to come to and wait for the turn of the tide. The sea reach of the Thames stretched before us like the beginning of an interminable waterway. In the offering, the sea and the sky were welded together without a joint, 
and in the luminous space the tanned sails of the barges drifting up with the tide seem to stand still in red clusters of canvas sharply peaked with gleams of varnished sprits. A haze rested on the low shores that ran out to sea in vanishing flatness. The air was dark above Gravesend, and farther back still seemed condensed into a mournful gloom, brooding motionless of the biggest and the greatest town on earth. The director of companies was our captain and our host. We four affectionately watched his back as he stood on the bows, looking to seaward. On the whole river there was nothing that looked half so nautical. He resembled a pilot, which to a seaman is trustworthiness personified. It was difficult to realize his work was not out there in the luminous estuary, but behind him, within the brooding blue. Between us there was, as I have already said somewhere, the bond of the seat. Besides holding our hearts together through long periods of separation, it had the effect of making us tolerant of each other's yarns, and even convictions. The lawyer, the best of old fellows, had, because of his many years and many virtues, the only cushion on deck and was lying on the only rug. The accountant had brought out already a box of dominoes and was toying architecturally with the boat. Marlow sat cross-legged right at leaning against the mizzen mast. He had sunken cheeks, a yellow complexion, a straight back, an ascetic aspect, and with his arms dropped, the palms of hands outwards resembled an idol. <coughs> the director, satisfied the anchor had good hold, made his way aft and sat down amongst us. Okay. And then he's not stop there. Yeah? Um, okay. Um, so um, I guess, yeah, just then um, uh, the, the bride is um, uh, transgender but is also pregnant. Um, uh, I think it, there's a kind of, um, I mean, I chose um, Conrad because it's such an iconic uh, book that tr um, set out to be anti-racist by critiquing uh, Belgian colonialism, but ends up supporting uh, British colonialism. Um, and I was also interested in his language, that he's Polish speaking, and then learns English, and then writes in English. Um, and so I was in interested in someone who invents the language. Um, uh, so there, yeah, n a number of reasons um, you know, for him. And, and again, um, uh, I guess that particular novel um, of how important it's been um, within, you know, culture. I mean, Apocalypse Now, the film, is based on, uh, you know, uh, based on the novel. There have been so many other iterations of it and so on. Um, and so I, I just felt I kept coming back to it. I, I just needed to engage with it. Um, so, okay. So I hope that will, that will give you sort of glimpses uh, into some of sort of my working methods. So thank you. Uh -huh. um, and so I just wonder for you, you know, what are the stories that sort of 
Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So I, th I think you know, as I'd mentioned at the beginning, uh, the, and there's the relationship of the body to speech as well. You know, who's speaking. Um, I think one one of the things I sort of negotiate um, is um, the idea of the spectacular, uh, and and the sort of demand on artists, if you're going to exhibit internationally, the demand to be spectacular. Um, which I'm always resistant to. And so, um, you know, I, don't, I haven't sort of found an answer to that. And, and I think each, each project is sort of trying to figure out how to do that. Um, how to sort of prioritize the sort of content of the work. Um, uh, and often by making the, um, the process of, 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 of fabrication and of making a, a, apparent, um, and, you know, I think there are skills that one acquires over a period of time, you know, even whether it's sort of taking photographs or printing or, um, you know, building models with fingernails. Um, you know, I think um, to play against the notion of artistic skill that's somehow um, endowed by genius, uh, or there's only a select few of us who can do that. You know, so I think it's it's certainly there's a lot of labor in, in what I set out to do, and you know, I mean, rewriting Conrad is is a ridiculous thing to do, um, and you know, I mean, it takes years and constantly rewriting, um, and for some reason I have a sort of amnesia of just how much labor each previous project took, and I so when I begin a new one, it just is like, oh, this is such an interesting idea, let me see what happens with that, and then five years later, you know, I'm still doing it, um, but it is something about the sort of mundane accumulation, I think, um, rather than the spectacular gesture that, that I'm interested in. You know. um, but of course, then the body is so involved in that mundane labor. You know. um, and I think um, there is a relationship in the kind of, um, in the very physical labor, the manual labor I've done um, uh, at different times in my life as a living. And, and who's expected to do that labor? You know, I've, I've worked, as, a, as I mentioned, as a street sweeper. I've worked in kitchens and, you know, those kind of things. Um, yeah. yeah, please. So this is somewhat related. Um, I'm very curious to hear what you have to say about your various senses of humor. Um, okay. Because it goes from Yeah, no, that, that you know, that's that's a, a sort of um, great observation, and, and the, the the sort of ways you're situating humor. Um, I think humor is, is is a way that allows you to speak about things that um, otherwise difficult to bring into language. So it's actually something like you know, death, violence. Like, how does one talk about colonialism? Like, who wants to talk about colonial, colonialism? And so, but then there's also like, how do you can you bring humor to something like that? Um, uh, so I am interested in, can, can humor provide sort of entry points? Um, can it be initially funny and then it stops being funny? And I'm also in, in that, interested in that moment of when does something stop being funny because it reveals something else? Um, um, but, I, but I think I'm mostly interested in humor as a way to um, to be able to speak of something which is otherwise unspeakable. You know, um, that there is a kind of deliberate levity, uh, initially anyway. But then once you become embedded in the subject matter, then um, I'm hoping the viewer gets caught in a way that then they're led to other things, uh, past the humor. Um, uh, and, and I think there's, there's a kind of permission too. I mean. Um, the kind of racism within Conrad, for example, and I mentioned this in, in terms of the monkeys, that there's a kind of violence in literature, in painting history and so on, 
um, and to restage it and address those violence not um, without necessarily replicating the violence, I think, like, how does one expose it? That there is a kind of violence that's operating in, in what might seem to be the most innocuous, innocuous kind of representations. Um, so then to make, make it apparent through humor, I think. Anything else? Talk about movies. <laughs> I'll take, can we take one more? Oh, there's a kind of fan that's sort of. You know, Yeah, that, that's, you know, it's, it's a really important question, I think, because um, I'm, I'm not sure how much work uh, an object can do. Um, you know, can, um, uh, you know, can a photograph or a sculpture um, do, do the work that one wants to, it to do? If, um, uh, you know, engaging audiences in different sort of complex way, different kinds of narratives and so on. Um, and so, you know, I teach, and so teaching for me is, is, um, is part of my studio practice. Um, uh, I write quite a bit, I mean, not just rewriting, but, um, you know, the book that was mentioned, um, uh, How Art Can Be Thought, is, is looking at the language we use to talk about art. Um, and so all these things um, I see as part of my studio practice, as part of my art practice. Um, and I think they're necessary because to go past the limits of what the object can do. Um, uh, and uh, you know, a, a lot of the um, the activating of an object is done through the exhibition. You know, it's done by the curator, as by the discussion around the work, and so on. So it takes place around the object rather than the object doing it itself. But the object. Um, can be the focus and can be the, um, not necessarily the starting point, but a kind of um, a way of generating um, other sort of questions and discourse and so on. But that needs to be done around it, you know. And, and so those are the things I'm also interested in uh, and to be engaged with them by, by writing and doing talks and uh, teaching and, and so on. Oh, I can, I, can, I can repeat the question. Okay. Just spaces of the work as being made, is it the piece in New Orleans that had the map, um, the, the work that carried us through mm -hmm. to the country, okay. of course, to the first perspective? I'm curious how, um, how location influences it, or um, maybe okay. you have to point to, you know, you know how location oh, uh -huh. is um, informing the work that you're choosing to produce. Yeah. So, um, so the location of the of the gallery space, uh, well, as well as the. Where you are living, or how yeah. did you choose to live in Las Vegas specifically to produce photos? Right. You were talking about Maine when you were in the sea, uh -huh. and then you moved back to. Right. Yeah. Okay. So I guess the, yeah, the importance of location, both for me as an artist and in, in being sort of fairly mobile, um, and you know, for work reasons, for family reasons, and so on, um, uh, but also the location of of exhibiting spaces as well. Um, uh, I mean, I think of my work um, uh, certainly responsive to site and location. Um, I do think of it as being discourse specific rather than site specific. Um, and, and I am interested in how ideas travel. Um, and uh, Alison and I actually um, did an essay which was a conversation between us when we were both traveling, and so it was written from different locations. And we were interested in how ideas, um, like translation, 
um, how ideas move, can move from one place to another, but how they might change from one place to another as well, or get mutated in, in that. Um, uh, and so I really am um, a sort of ongoing uh, question my work around these questions of mobility and temporary status, stasis, uh, not like necessarily s like settling in a place, but what does it mean to um, uh, be in a space for a while? And, and I'm interested in, in tourism for that, for that reason. You know, I, I don't discount tourism as a form of knowledge because um, I think there is something important about the idea of seeing from outside, not that we can ever do that completely, um, but, but not to discount that. You know. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, I gave the example of Shape of Water as a film that's not seen as being political, you know, that it's cast so much as a, as a fantasy uh, and all about love, but, and I haven't seen any reviews talking about the different bodies that are involved in that film um, and how they get either contained by the circumstances or activated through each other. Um, and, I mean, I, I do think... Um, there is a separate category of political art, which is where the artist intends it to be political. Um, and, 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 but I think, you know, as culture, all art is inevitably functions within a social and political realm. And we as viewers activate it politically or not. You know, uh, I mean, we can actually um, shut down its political possibilities as viewers. Um, but because I'm interested in in, in how art gets activated, which is why like, I feel I have to also then engage in other ways with audiences. Oh, yes. Uh, thanks for your talk. Um, as I was watching you give your presentation, I was thinking on one hand, how does this man organize his working space, his studio? Uh, <laughs> considering, uh, you know, you have worked in studios, but I'm wondering if you could talk to us about how you organize your workspace, uh, given that you collect a lot of... Mm -hmm. Where do you keep those toenails? Oh, okay. <laughs> well, you know, tw 20 years of fingernails and toenails really doesn't take up much space. <laughs> but in terms of, uh, just yeah, if you no, tell spatially no. how you situate yourself in relation to your things, whether they're family photographs, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yourself. I mean, well, you, okay. How how do you work? Do you work with this meticulous, time-consuming approach? I wonder if you work in ten-hour stretches, oh. or you do bits by bits. Can you talk oh. to us a bit um, about that? Yeah, no, those are great questions. Thank you. Um, well, I love that you you use the word organize, mm -hmm. and organize spaces, which I I certainly don't think of my uh, work process and and working habits and workspaces as being organized. Um, uh, I do have um, two studios, um, one, one at home and, and one actually at the university where I teach. Um, uh, and so, you know, between a clean space and, and a sort of slightly messier space. Um, I do work constantly, um, but, I, but I also work, uh, you know, I work on the plane, I work on the bus, um, so wherever I am. And so I've adapted my sort of working habits to be able to work while mobile. Like, I, I don't need a, a set physical space to be able to work, um, which also then determines the different ways I do work. So, you know, with, with writing, uh, I photograph constantly. Um, uh, it's only in the last month that I've trained myself not to always have a camera with me. Uh, before, I couldn't leave the house without a camera. I mean, now I have a phone, iPhone, which 
is sort of reasonable. Um, um, and, and, and the reason for that change is because I'm, I'm working so much on specific projects that actually I got overwhelmed with um, new ideas that I'm constantly photographing. Um, but that, that has been a method to create this sort of uh, um, accumulations of material um, and then going over them, um, which I do regularly, that, that's where ideas come from. It's just a sort of constant monitoring of like, oh, what do I have here? Um, as well as sort of um, organizing, if I would, uh, that kind of archive of materials. Um, my studio's kind of a mess at the moment because I was collecting for the installation upstairs. Um, like whatever materials I thought might be relevant. So my studio is just full of clothing and other cat condos and um, uh, um, just stuff I found. Um, and, and actually what, what uh, um, allows me to be more organized is that I've been, uh, I've moved a lot. Um, and so, you know, when I moved from, uh, from England to the US, I just threw away so much. And so every time I move, I get rid of stuff. Um, uh, that, that's the only thing that keeps me organized. Um, uh, but yeah, other materials, um, yeah, all the, all the, it helps to have a private bathroom, like your own bathroom, where you can keep those, um, I won't go into details. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, private spaces, um, much as um, I don't sort of venerate the idea of, you know, the sort of mythical romantic notion of a studio, um, it's only a space where one can think and collect. For me, that's really important. Uh, my clean space is because I have a, a, a large format printer. Uh, so I, I, I need to keep that clean. Okay, that's it. okay well, thank you so much. <laughs>